Alright, so I'm Andy Doan and I work on the engineering resources team. And um, I want to talk about participating in the Lenaro community. And um, it's a little bit just kind of uh, participating in open source in general. Uh, kind of with an emphasis when you come from maybe working like, I worked at IBM before I joined here, so I had worked on open source stuff, but never in open source. So it was always kind of in this, uh, you know, closed source background. Uh, it was kind of in, this talk was inspired by a few people. I kind of stole good ideas from a lot of guys. The uh, first person was Paul McKinney, uh, back at uh, Cambridge. We had a sprint, he did a talk called uh, Confessions of a Proprietary Programmer. And there was a lot of stuff in there about things he had learned going from doing proprietary programming to open source. And it, I thought it was really good. And there were a lot of just general things that would apply to just working in open source. Um, we also had a guy named Tixie, John Medhurst. And he started out as a community member with Lenaro. We didn't even know who he was. I, I think when he showed up at Budapest back in May, I thought he actually worked for Lenaro. And it <laughs> turned out he was just doing this stuff on his own time. And now he's full time for Lenaro, and he's kind of like our great success story for, you know, you can get involved and help out. And then I also had uh, sent out feedback a few months ago to people. I'm always trying to figure out how to make people's job, how, how people can get productive easier in Lenaro. So I sent out an email asking for feedback on things people struggle with. And uh, Zach Pfeffer and James Tunnicliffe and Jesse Barker all kind of had some similar ideas. And the gist of what I was seeing was they were used to doing things in a proprietary company. And then when it came to Lenaro, things were a little bit different. So I kind of took all that together and, and came up with this. And then for my own background, so I, I felt like I might be good at talking about this because I started Lenaro in January. Before that, I'd been at IBM for 11 years, and like I said, I've worked. I've been doing embedded development on Linux for the past six, but it was you know all closed doors, and it really was kind of a, a new uh, world for me. So for the agenda, I want to cover a few topics. The first thing is uh, what I call saying hi to a thousand people, and it's. Kind of this, when you first start an open source company, it's kind of hard just to reach out and you know figure out who to say hi to and, and how to do it. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the learning curve, and this is kind of specific to Lenaro, but I think you know there's some ideas that you can take away just in general. Uh, third topic is how you can help us at Lenaro, which is something that we want to. This is more for community people, but. Um, you know, we want to encourage people to participate, and we have some ideas. And then the last topic, I want to talk a little bit about submitting work in open source, which was, this was kind of one of the things that uh, Jesse and James and Zach kind of talked about. It was really different than uh, working at a, working in an open source company. So, the first topic is uh, what I'm calling, you know, just saying hi to people. Uh, one of the... I think one of the hardest things to do when joining a community like Lenaro is just saying that hi. I don't really mean that first time you say hi. That's pretty easy, you know, hey, I just joined the Android team, whatever. I, I'm talking more about that first time you need to interact at like a technical level or whatever you're doing to do your job. It's, uh, it's a little bit different. And um, I think there, there's a few reasons. I think the first thing is it's a bit intimidating. I, I know for myself, I think it was my fourth day at Lenaro, I had to get up and talk for 10 minutes about Git. And we have employees at Lenaro, like Nicholas Peter, he wrote large chunks of Git. So, you know, you're standing up talking in front of people, and it's just really intimidating getting over that. Um, and then I think another aspect of it is like how you even do it. You know, there, you've got email, you've got IRC. You may have a bug, and you know how, how do I best open a bug report and get somebody's attention? So there's kind of these things that, that make it a little bit different to uh, to just you know say hi and get a part of the community. I think a big reason for this for me, and this is really when you're coming from uh, when you've been working 
a closed source company is communication is really different in open source. And it, it wasn't real obvious to me at first, but um, when you're working in a proprietary company, and I, I worked at a company that was less than 60 people, and I worked at IBM when there was, you know, 400,000. But the thing I noticed with that is most of your communication in these companies is really small. Like, I doubt in 10 years I sent an email to over 10 people. I could count them on, you know, one hand. You know, it's, you're talking to your team and you're organizing things. And even say, like, we have things like IRC in our companies, but it was always such a smaller audience. And suddenly you start Lenaro and you're on some mailing list and you don't know how many people are on there. You get a chat room and there's, you know, 300 people. So it's, uh, it's just a lot different. And then there were things such as um, with IRC, I'm in the, I'm on Central Time now. A lot of Lenaro peak hours, I would say, are really but more kind of the European time zone. So there's all this stuff that was going on that I was kind of missing at first. And Zach also mentioned that how he just had no idea how important the IRC and specifically BIP was. And I don't know if you guys have used BIP, but if you're especially when you're first joining. BIP is this uh, cool, it's an IRC proxy server. And the best way I can explain it, normally when you use IRC, once you shut it down, you're off and you don't know what's going on. With BIP, it sits online all day and like keeps all the conversations. And every time you log in, it'll replay everything that you miss. So especially when you're starting, it's kind of good to get a feel for how people are talking and how things happen. Anymore, I feel like when I, when I log on to my IRC, it's kind of like the matrix in that scene where they, you kind of learn how to just filter out and ignore stuff, but you still pick up big things. And then another thing with email that people are used to in most companies, you're using like Exchange or something, wherever, all your emails like top posting, and you start interacting on mailing lists, and there's this whole new open source etiquette for how you respond in line. And, um, just kind of some barriers. Now, here are, it's not all negative. There are good ways of doing this. And I think Tixie, John Methurst, is really our best example of, of how to start doing this. He, um, as I said earlier, he was just got involved in the community. He found Lenaro and had some hardware, started hacking on it on his own, and started doing some really good stuff. And, you know, now he's full time, but I, once he came on, I asked him, you know, what, how did you do this? What were your keys to success? And he, he kind of, I've, I've summarized it into these three things. The first one, lurking, I, that sounds a little creepy, but what I, what I mean about that is he was, a, it's kind of a passive way. He started by listening a lot. He said he uh, joined all of our mailing lists to uh, see what was going on there. He started getting on the IRC channels, but it was a lot of listening and figuring out who's who. Um, one thing he said that he was doing was he got on the wiki and started studying things. Uh, one big page for him was meet the team, which I thought was interesting because he's trying to figure out how to do stuff. But what he's saying is with the meet the team, you can see who's doing what, who you need to talk to when you need help. And it's all right there. It's broken up by, you know, who works on what team. And, uh, you know, he also um, found, like, some different how-to pages on the wiki and kept them bookmarked and kept going back to them. Then he kind of took from there and started listening in to some of the weekly IRC meetings. So all of our teams meet every week. It's on IRC. You can see what they're talking about working on. And he was kind of watching that, and then he found his opening. So he saw some work that he felt comfortable, that he knew the subject matter, and he could tell that no one was working on it because he'd been kind of tracking what was going on. So at that point, he actually reached out to a tech lead and introduced himself, and you know, he said, I, I feel good about this uh, content. You know, maybe I can start hacking on it. And the person you know, welcomed his contributions. Now, along with uh, saying hi and this communication, kind of shoehorning this in a little bit, but there's this topic of working from home that I, I think it fits in with this a bit. Uh, there's actually a page we have, and I'm going to pull it up. It's on the uh, canonical wiki. Hopefully, this will. 
or sorry, on the Lenaro wiki. Let me see if I can. There's one on the canonical wiki as well. Yeah, it's on the. Oh, I can't get it to. Uh, Well, I, I can talk about this for now. I, I, there's some other stuff I want to show you in the browser in a bit, but I can talk through these. So, one of the big things that this wiki page has is it talks about scheduling when you're working from home. And what it's talking about is trying to keep, you're working from home, so it's really easy to kind of work here and there, but you really need to just have a set of core hours. And it's important for two things. First of all, it's important to you. You can start to separate your life from your job. And when you start working from home, those, those boundaries can get really blurred <laughs> after a while. But the second thing is it helps set expectations. Like, my manager knows that he can reach me within a reasonable time frame, and you can kind of expect, like, when turnaround on a response to an email is going to come. Uh, along with that, it's kind of scheduling a, a daily routine. I thought this one was interesting. I had kind of done it working from home, but when I read it on this uh, page, it, it really kind of struck a chord with me. They were saying, you know, generally, you treat it like a job. So if you usually get up and eat breakfast and then take a shower and drive into work, well, when you start working from home, do the same thing and then walk into your office. And one of the things it mentions is just put clothes on. You've got to, you need to, the, the daily routine helps you make that mental transition from I'm in my house and I'm playing with my wife and kids to I'm at work and you know there are things I have to get done today. And another thing that falls into that is the physical organization. So this is really hard. I, I just uh, moved into a house a few weeks ago, but before that we were living in a small apartment and trying to have like a workspace for my laptop and a panda board and a beagle board, it gets really uh, messy and you're tempted to just work from your bed or something. But you need to try to set aside that work uh, that work area. It it makes you more efficient, makes you more ergonomical, so you're not like hunched over. And it also helps again with that kind of mental transition that you need to make every day to start working. The difference is that you, you don't have to wear a tie. Yeah, <laughs> I found that I don't shave very much anymore either. And another thing is this avoiding distractions. Uh, that, one, that one can be hard. I, I kind of started setting aside some hard rules. So I don't mind, for example, starting a load of laundry, but I don't, I'm not going to fold the clothes because that's too big of a time thing. Like if I'm just waiting for the kernel to compile, I can throw in a bunch of lights and not worry. But sometimes my wife gets mad. She's like, you're going to start it, finish it. But, that's what I mean by the distractions, you know, don't try to just, it's like you're at work every day. Um, managing emails, what I was going to say here, and most people kind of do this anyways, but before I started Lenaro, my daily inbox, I might get 20 or 30 emails. Again, it's kind of this communication I was talking about. When the, the number of people grows and you start getting on these mailing lists, they're so huge. At first, I didn't set up filters or anything like that, and I would just come into work and I look at my mailbox, and it's almost like paralysis. You don't even know how to get started. So, you know, I started setting up mail, uh, filters basically for each one of my uh, mailing lists that I subscribe to to go into that, and you know, that way my inbox is important things. And then another thing I, I've started kind of doing to help further with that is I, I, I use Thunderbird, but any email client kind of does this. You can set up rules based on the content of the email to, to flag it. So anything that mentions Andy or um, on another mailing list, I'm kind of interested in Overo stuff. I, I have these things where it, even when I'm going through like a list of like LKML stuff, if someone sends something to me, it'll show up and kind of visually differentiate, so it's a little easier to filter through. The, the last thing, the, the wiki page calls this exercise, and I'm not going to tell everybody to exercise, but leaving the house, if you just start working from home, you'll get in this kind of groove where you'll realize, my gosh, I haven't seen the sun in two days. <laughs> and it just gets you in a bad mood, you start working poorly, so I, one thing I do every evening when I get done, my wife and I just walk around the block for 20 minutes. And it, it really does help you uh, 
keep your sanity. That, that is that is very true. Another thing for that is um, I know I've seen this in a couple of different open source communities where um, people are putting out like there's now in Wolverhampton there's a group that's meeting up every like once a month or something. They're all people who work from home, so they found a place that'll let them come with Wi-Fi. You know, so they're all working. From yeah, those stuff, are really so, neat. So uh, that shared space type thing. Along that, I know that the canonical uh, Austin. It's not just a, I don't think it's just canonical employees, but just it happens to be a launch pad group you can subscribe to. And every Thursday we meet at this, uh, it's actually a, a brewery, or not a brewery, it's a, it's a bar, but <laughs> we actually work there that afternoon together and they have free Wi Fi and they don't mind you leeching on it all day. And then it kind of turns it into a nice little happy hour at the end. So, yeah, those things work really well. Uh, uh, another topic is the learning. Oh, sorry. The the learning curve. Dealing with the learning curve at Lenaro, um, we encompass a lot of things. I think that's one of the hardest aspects. Is I think for the first maybe nine months we didn't know exactly what we did. Our our head of HR, Mike Levine, was just kind of starting to put together like kind of a mission statement because we we encompass a lot and it gets confusing. We've had meetings this week on, there was a session entitled Stopping the Wiki Madness. And there was another one on, we've got 40 Lenaro subdomains. How do, you know, how do we make sense of all this? So that, that part's a little tricky, but I do have a good place to start when you're looking at Lenaro. And let me see if I can actually get this presentation. We have a community page. Here's the uh, working better from home link that I was uh, talking about a second ago. We also have a community page, and this really helps when uh, if you want to find out about what our community is doing and how you can start to uh, fit in with it. Take a look at that community page, and it will help you drill down into whatever aspect of Lenara you might be interested in. So. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, finding things, and this is, uh, I, I put a picture of Homer Simpson up here, I don't know if you guys watch The Simpsons, but he once had a quote that beer was the cause of and solution to all of life's problems, and I don't think there's a better quote that describes the Lenaro Wiki than that. It's, uh, <laughs> the Wiki's great, it's just... It's so easy to add things, that, like the barrier of contribution just becomes, anytime you want to do something, so we were talking the other day, you know, we put meeting minutes in there, we put this, we put that, and it just starts to get really small. But we do have some ways to find things. That's what I was going to show you, is a, a couple of tricks for actually finding material on the wiki. So let me um, pull up a browser, and I was going to show you just a few tricks on that. So, let me bring up search box and you usually think that's going to be handy and in some cases it, it it is handy but the thing you have to realize is by default here like where my arrow is showing it's going to search by titles and if your search term doesn't match a wiki a, the actual name of a wiki page it's just not going to show anything up so in some cases say I do panda This actually brings 
to that, that first link is the what you want when you're uh, working with Panda. But there's some things, say blueprint naming conventions, that returns nothing. And it's almost confusing when it returns nothing. But in that case, a lot of times you can just say search by text. And that's actually the most relevant link you're going to want. Sometimes you don't really know quite the right thing, and you need the power of Google to help you. And in that case, you can use Google Site Search on our wiki. And this actually works pretty good. So we have a, if, if you just search for blueprints on our wiki, there's a million pages that are going to show up. And the top ones aren't relevant at all. But if you do sidewiki.lenar.org blueprints, actually something just changed. This used to be the top one, but this second link is the most valid one that you want. So my takeaway from this for you guys when you're trying to find things. Title works good if you think you know the title. Text, I kind of have the fall throughs. I always start with title, then I go to text, and then Google will usually find something if uh, worse comes to worse. Let me bring my slides back up. Can we put a, a direct link to that? To, to that sort of meta tag? So there, we, one of the things that we did this week is we're going to try to get a unified search. So that you can just search, it'll search lenaro.org, uh, connect.lenaro.org, wiki.lenaro. So hopefully that will roll out um, sometime soon. So now that you know how to uh, find things, you ought to say hi. We want to talk about how you can help with Lenaro. And the big thing I want to say is that anybody can help. You don't have to be in Lenaro to help. We, we welcome stuff from the community. And like that link I showed earlier, the community page is a, a good place to, to get started with that. I also want to um, give you some specific ideas. Um, the first thing that we really welcome is we have a lot of different hardware and it's hard for us to test it each week. And Automated testing only goes so far. Some of that's hard to say, hey, this screen looks weird, you know, or sound doesn't work. But uh, every month, if you're on the Lenaro.dev uh, Lenaro -dev mailing list, we'll send out a, a call for testing. And in that, there will actually be like a link to all the different downloads. It'll have instructions for how to install them. And it also includes a field to um, fill out like kind of a QA report, what worked and what didn't work. And that helps us a lot. You know, you may test something. For instance, I, uh, I, I have an Overo board and it's kind of just a community supported platform. So a lot of times that doesn't get noticed and I'll find little bugs and that's kind of one of the ways that I've actually been able to help a lot with Lenaro. If I'm going to skip down to the file bug because this kind of fits in with doing this testing. Not only does testing help, but if you file a bug, that's fantastic. I mean, that helps us. If you find a real problem, describe it well. And filing a bug, why I really want to include this, it's a really great way to help get involved in our community because if you try to help and fix the bug and potentially submit a patch, it's a super way to get involved and see how things work in our community. So, if some, some of these, like, you know, I say testing an image, that if you really want to code, you know, testing an image isn't that fun, or my, my suggestion here on helping the wiki, some of those aren't real coding ways, but if you want to kind of scratch an itch as a programmer, find a bug and then post a patch. Help improve the wiki, that's my personal cry for, for help from you guys. There's, there's a lot of ways. If, if you're looking at a page and you see a broken link, Anybody can edit the wiki, so you know, fix a broken link or 
If you see a page that's bad, no longer accurate, if you don't feel comfortable with it, just there, there's links to you know the people who maintain the wiki, which is myself. Let me know, and you know we'll keep the wiki in better health. Let's. I kind of feel like right now we're going through a phase, uh, kind of like farm consolidation, when Linus sent out that note a few months ago, and everybody kind of rushed to help decrease the number of lines in the arm kernel. We we need to do that in the Lenora wiki, and that. You'd be surprised the benefit of doing that, Make, making it easier. You can impact a lot of people because we're a growing community. And the last thing is uh, answering uh, questions on ask.lenaro.org. People post stuff, and we actually see a pretty healthy amount of traffic. Where you know, a lot of times people are a little unsure how they want to participate in our community, and that's kind of a real low barrier to uh, entry to, to ask a question. And Michael in the back there. He spends a lot of time trying to answer those questions and you know if people start helping out and it builds up karma over time so people kind of see how many things you did so it's kind of a little badge of honor that you can get. If you want to do that is a uh, thing that I'll recommend there are email settings once you create your account on ask.lenar.org and you can set it up to when someone asks a question and it'll email it to you that way you don't have to sit there and troll the page every day. You can, uh, just pay attention to, to what matters. And another way, I guess that it's kind of weird, but if you're wanting to try to figure out how you can help, ask on ask.lenar.org. And Michael's our community <laughs> manager also, so he will have suggestions for how you can help us. <laughs> and the last thing I wanted to talk about is submitting your work. And this is more from like a, a technical, like if you have a patch and stuff. I think this is the most different aspect of working in open source than uh, working in a private company. This is more kind of a joke. It, I don't think that LKML is really that terrifying, but the, the thing I want to talk about were some, some coding tips. The, the first thing is readability. And when I'm talking about the important thing about readability to me is when, when I was working at a, my last company, I, you tend, people tend to work on specific modules and you don't have a lot of people looking at your code. You know, I worked on this one area of like user authentication and I, that was just my thing. No one ever really looked at it. I would send, you know, code reviews and have it looked at before I checked it in, but uh, there wasn't time spent reading my code. When you look at somewhere like the Linux kernel, the ratio of people reading code to writing code is just huge. It's completely flip flop from what you're doing in a closed company. So the consistency of little things like spaces between brackets where it didn't matter in my old job, that matters now because the code's always being read and it's rarely being written, well, relatively, rarely, rarely being written to. And that part of readability then falls into um, something that uh, James Tunnicliffe had pointed out to me about thinking about small targeted chunks. So this is another thing, even when uh, in my other job when I could submit code and people would have it reviewed, a lot of times I would do fairly big chunks of changes, you know. I would do one feature in, in a single command. Actually, I tried to avoid it because it drove me nuts reviewing other people's code. <coughs> But that tends to be more of the mentality. You can just drop these big fixes. And it, you just can't do that in open source community. They want to see how you got to that destination. And I found that it's the same way, I'm talking about the Linux kernel specifically, but we had a discussion on Bazaar usage the other day. And they do something very similar like in how the code review process works in Bazaar. So, You've got to break these chunk. You've got to break your work up in these small chunks so they can see how you arrived at that destination. A key part of those chunks that it almost makes it harder sometimes. Well, I don't think it makes it harder, Cody. I think if you do it this way, it makes you a better programmer. But I, it's the term they call within Git. It's bisectability. So things break, and you know, like if you look at the kernel, say a thousand different commits go in. When something just suddenly breaks, it's really hard just to look at all those commits and figure out what happened. So what they tend to do is this thing called bisect, where you take a, 
a known good point and a known bad point, and you just start doing a binary search to see where things grow. If you don't make your chunks to where they all build in the kernel or whatever piece of software can run at each point in that, then you lose that bisectability and you make everybody's job much, much more difficult. So that kind of, I guess when you're coming into something and you first like submit these patches and people kind of get mad at you and it's a bit frustrating at first because you're like, man, I've got this working, just take it. There, there is a reason to it and in the long run that these things, it'll make you a better programmer and it'll make the world happier. And, it, this falls into be ready for revisions. So when you're doing these big chunks of work, we have guys right now in Lenaro who are, are famous hackers and they're on like, you know, I don't even know what struct clock is on in versions of commits right now. I mean, there's probably been 30 revisions sent out at this point. And getting people to a consensus on some things is really hard, to, especially the big changes. But when you're doing these big changes, this is something I've noticed that's really important just over time reading his mailing list is the RFC patch. This is the request for comments. So before you get too far down the road of a big change, if you're wanting to work in an open community, you need to kind of send out your idea in just a rough patch. You don't need to have everything figured out, but you need to send this out for two reasons. The first one is people may not like your idea and then you're just going to waste your time. So you need it. Well, actually, there's probably three reasons. The second reason is people get kind of mad when you just send out a bunch of patches, even if it was a good idea. And the third reason, which is also important, someone else may already be kind of working on a similar thing, and you two, you know, you two will need to work together to come up with a solution. And to help tackle those first three bullet points, I want to talk just a little bit about the tools to help you with this. If you're setting up uh, your development environment, this is it specific, but Bazaar has kind of tools in a similar way. You need to think about these before you start doing the code. If you do it after, then it gets painful. What, what winds up happening is you don't have your, your dev environment set up. Well, I saw this happen all the time at, at my last company, and I would send back like review comments to someone, and they might even agree with the comments, but their dev environment was so kind of one shot and I'm done that they couldn't go back and really make good change, like the quality changes to their updates. So people were just resistant to it. And the two, the the tool that really helps with Git is stgit. If you're new to Git, it's it's the most amazing thing ever. It will change your life. It's like Quilt if you guys have used that. But the concept of of stgit and Quilt is when you start working on, say, a line of development, you create a branch that you're going to be doing your, your features off of. And each, each commit that you make on it is kept as a, a queue. So you start, say you make the, you're doing a web app of some sort. The first thing you may do is your database model. And then the next part, you may want to do the view. And there may be things that follow on. And you're going to have those broken up and say in like three different patches. Well, when you get to the, that top patch that's some like UI specific thing, you're going to realize, man, I messed something up in the data model. I need to change it. When you use stgit, what it allows you to do is push and pop changes off that queue. So you can kind of uh, issue like a pop pop command, and now you're back on that very first commit, and you can clean that up. And it'll, it allows you to make these good quality clean code changes in a really easy way. Otherwise, what would have happened when you haven't set this up Beforehand, you're going to make a fourth commit that's clean up all the junk in the first commit. And especially projects that use Git, they don't like that at all. Bizarre guys are a little more online with that kind of dev style, but even when you're setting up your first commit for Bizarre, you may as well get that one clean. And then the re revisions that follow, they may come on top of that, whereas in Git, the like a kernel project, when they come back with comments, you have to fix the individual patches. So that's a great way out. Now, as an example, just to kind of finish on with that, what I would do if I was, say, working on a kernel patch, I would create a branch for the revision one of that patch, and you might say it's three commits. And as I work on it, I'd be using stgit to clean everything up, get it nice and ready. Then you're going to send it to LKML. And they're going to come back and say, no, this is terrible, make some changes. At that point, 
you can create a new branch that's version two of these patches, and you can start cherry picking those over one by one, but then you can still use stgit again to clean those up. So it's, it's just nice to think about this ahead of time and actually get competent with it before you even start doing a lot of coding changes because it will make you easier to deal with and more accepting of people's feedback because it's easy to incorporate their feedback. And that's uh, really all the uh, content I had. I, I kind of wanted to just finish. I'm not sure how much time we have left. We got like 15 minutes. Um, I didn't know if you guys had questions or if y'all wanted to. One thing I was kind of wanted to get out of you guys besides the questions is uh, if you've been kind of working with one our own, like what kind of barriers to you know getting started with us you've been finding. We, we, well, if, in comparison to like an Ubuntu community, it's still small, but we were actually, uh, I think last I checked on the wiki, what, we've got 200,000 viewers or something of the wiki. Is that right, Jimmy? Yeah, a little over. Two, oh, the wiki itself, a little over 200,000 page views. So, you know, we're, we're hitting a point where we've got a lot of words getting out of what like what we've done and how it's beneficial and we're starting to get a lot of people to I think the bigger difference between us and Ubuntu is more we're a little more niche you know we're embedded stuff on R versus just anyone that owns a computer so we, we have a, a bit different target audience right now but there's a question based on that do you think your target audience is ever going to grow you know, with this idea of phones and everything like that, so that it will possibly. I, I absolutely think so. I mean, I. I mean, I come from community, I'm more community. I do a bunch of accessibility, and you know, I came to this because I was thinking there's got to be something that I can do that'll also contribute to Lenaro. But I don't, you know, I'm not much of a developer. I just. Yeah. Well. Okay. So this is, that's kind of two questions as far as. Helping accessibility wise, I just had a, com a conversation with our HR guy earlier, <laughs> and I was saying, you know, we, we should start thinking about accessibility issues. You know, I, I know, like, our web pages just, I don't think they're good at, for uh, people with screen readers, for example. So, you know, that. Come talk to me, I'll. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to uh, get your information yeah. and talk to you afterwards, because, I mean, that would be a fantastic way to, to help out with this. Now, as far as our community growing, I, I'll, I'll give you my sell on this. I mean, I, I think ARM is really cool, and I, I hope to see it kind of grow really huge, and we're going to start seeing ARM in the server market. Uh, I think there's so much potential for it. I, I can't wait to get my hands on a laptop that runs on ARM, and I'll you know plug it in once a day instead of every other hour. I, I was scared to leave this unplugged just for the, this uh, talk alone. So I think ARM is, I, I really hope it's going to grow. And I think Lenaro is going to be the, I mean, our goal is it's going to be the central place that, that all the cool stuff on Linux happens there. So. You, you, got, you can see a lot of that. Sorry, I'm sitting on the ground. I apologize. Sorry, Andy. I'm screen presentation. Up. The, um, the, the interesting thing about Lenaro is that we've had a lot of traffic. So when you look at uh, where we were, even at the beginning of this year, we were just on pure page hits alone on the web presence. We were running, around January, we were running about 50,000 page hits a month. By May or June, that was up to 80. We're, we're almost up to 200 a month now. Uh, and that's just the, the, the full uh, uh, website hits, not counting the developer ones, which we might have a bug here in the page hits background. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting, we have a lot more people that are trying to engage with us. Um, our Android uh, development lead was telling us just the other day that when, and when um, Google's Android uh, repository went offline for uh, a day or so. Oh, no. <laughs> is it a little a more? Month. Is it a month? Is that long? It was a long time. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was a kernel on Oreo. So. Oh, yeah. So, all right. So, the, you know, they, uh, you know, Zach was able to uh, tell people, hey, listen, you can come to us and you can get not only our mirror of 
of and the Android code, but also all of the cool enhancements. And so he mentioned to me that Cyanogen and another site are now using Lenaro as, uh, oh, yeah. as their pull source. So that's one weird thing that it's really interesting with Lenaro. So our one of our biggest missions is everything we do is upstream. So even people that don't use Lenaro, they're all using it. Like we have a bunch of guys that are making key uh, areas of change to the Linux kernel. We're doing amazing work with the uh, GCC tool chain, and people are taking that in. So even when you don't see like the Lenaro label on it, you're probably going to benefit from outputs of Lenaro. I don't mean to just turn this into an advertising campaign here, but. Uh, well, let me just question you. Uh, how would you convert uh, an ARM machine with uh, hardware? So, <laughs> they're very different. Right? We, I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is there aren't really any ARM, there, there aren't any ARM machines right now. The, right now, ARM is primarily in your cell phone and some, it's embedded use. And that's kind of where we're, we're wanting to grow. There's been talks this week about uh, there's a summit on uh, ARM servers. That's in, uh, in other words, can I connect to the uh, ARM machine that is a to the Arduino and then sensors? Yeah, you could do that. But yeah, you're going to be running all of it. I, I think what you're saying, yeah, you can, the, the ARM device can interact with all your normal stuff. Like your laptop or whatever, but you're not gonna. There's not a lot of like consumer devices that are just like computing devices that you know the keyboard and monitor that run on right now. Would you say that the, the, the ARM machine is like a computer, but another computer, a mini computer? Yeah, it is. It, I mean, it has the power now. I, I think so. I mean, there there are some guys that have little ARM uh, netbooks. They're just hard to find. It's just not really sold right now, but I mean, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to speak for everybody here, but I, I think that's... Uh, you can use a Panda as a desktop or as a, as a kiosk. Yeah. just works. So, if you uh, want. I don't have one with me. Actually, we've got a demo outside. You guys should go see that because, um, I mean, like this Panda board, it, I will run a full Ubuntu desktop on it. Uh, it runs 3G acceleration. Sorry, 3D <laughs> acceleration. <laughs> And it's pretty good. I, I mean, the the only kind of limiting thing to me, it's a bit annoying right now, is all these low-cost development boards, which is what we focused on, they uh, use micro SD cards or SD cards, and this guy was just kind of slow on those. So sometimes you get a little bit of lag from that, but as far as just pure computing power, they're great. And like, take an IMX53, and I think they have SATA on them. So it's, uh, it, it's happening. It's just time. I don't think you can build something like the, 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 the ones we have uh, connected to the monitor so that you take a scan you can build something like that at home or some put it with a yeah, TV or with a presentation so with a touch screen for uh, yeah. kiosks. Yeah, I think another really uh, neat thing, you, you'll, there's a demo outside of it. Um, we have someone that has set up a cluster of panel boards. He's got, I think, nine of them, and he's running the actual, well, it's an open source Google app engine. And like one of the most uh, famous Google app engine apps is this uh, code review tool called Writevelle. That they use it inside Google. It's kind of what Garrett is based off of, which is what runs Android, but he's running this thing on this nine cluster panda board, and he's got a little uh, power thing that measures, and like when it's plugged in and running, it's at like 35 watts. You'll plug in your your lap uh, your server at home, and you're going to be like 60. Listening to the lady in my mind, when I was I was thinking about the for her to use the the right phone and open the door. Yeah, all that stuff is. Uh... Can can you tell me how many commercial companies are using it now, rather than the open source upstream? Uh, to make prototypes or to make products? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't I know that we have that information somewhere. There was a poster of it around here yesterday, I believe. 
I don't know offhand. I don't, I don't have the data either. I, I, you're right, there was a poster, but... Uh, I, I know that some of the board makers uh, r prefer to release Lenaro image, images rather than their own stuff because it makes their customer feel confident that it's uh, some kind of upstream and I mean it, 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 it is produced by a, a, a trustworthy uh, upstream uh, source at least and yeah. like the uh, makers of the iJab V2 board they told me exactly that it gives confidence to their customers they ship their product with Lenaro so does Gumsticks as well they, uh, and they, in, in some places, uh, if they aren't using like the Lenaro kernel, the, one of the first big improvements, so Lenaro has been around about 18 months now, and one of the first early on things we did was uh, some really fantastic improvements to GCC. So there are a lot of people that are, uh, even if they aren't using like the Lenaro kernel, they pull our tool chain in because it's just so good right now. That's one of the neat things that the Android team that they're talking about, uh, Zach Pepper and his team, they've uh, gotten their build of Android, which is based on the Google 235 and moving to 237. That's all you have public access to right now. But they have theirs compiling on the Lenaro GCC 4.6. And currently what you get from Google, they, they build with uh, a 4.4. And we have a lot of uh, neat optimizations built in and stuff. And, but also, as Sandy said before, we try to upstream as much as possible. So even if they don't use the linear kernel, they are using things that when they use the upstream kernel or the upstream yeah, other project. Here's a here's an interesting thing. We always be one phase behind. So projects are different. So that's a goal of Linaro is that our members they want to get to a point where they're not working on a six month old kernel, they want to be able to work off TIFF. Exactly. It, it, that's one of the, the key things for Lenaro. It, here's another kind of uh, interesting thing, like uh, we've done some work on LibJPEG Turbo, which is an improved version of JPEG, and I think that potentially that may go actually into Ubuntu, because it's just such a huge improvement. It's like works twice as fast as LibJPEG. So it's another one of those things where, we're because we're commuting, uh, pushing upstream, I mean, we're not even, you know, this is going to be Ubuntu on x86, but you'll get the benefits of it. So, that's probably the neatest thing about Lenaro is everything we do, it makes it hard. Joey in the back, he's our uh, lead project, our program manager, and it makes his life really hard because it's hard to put schedules together. When's this going to get upstream? Do you, who knows? It depends on what mood somebody is on a mailing list one day. So, that makes it hard, but that is our really key metric for success, mm. is did it go upstream? So we're not gonna be off in our mm. own corner. We're gonna work with everyone. Another great thing with the boards we support is the, they always support it on tip. Like um, you, when you get the a quick start board from Freescape, for example, you get the latest kernel. So if you find a bug, you get a chance to, to, to yeah. try to, you get the latest code if you make a submission. I mean, uh, you always, it, in, in t it incites people to contribute because they, they're working on the latest, cooler stuff. And this is an advantage over Ubuntu, which is a bit, uh, lags a little bit behind because it works on the stable kernel. We don't. Every single month, we give you stuff that uh, that's, uh, co corresponds to the latest upstream. Yeah, so all the Lenaro builds this month were actually on $3 so we're getting there. The thing, the big goal now is so we're on the 3.1 kernel, and then there are all these patches that are enablement patches. And each month we kind of rebase those back on top. And our goal is to make that list of patches get down to zero. <laughs> and, and and we're thinking about uh, we're making strides to moving toward continuous integration as well across the board, not just Android. Yeah. Right. Another thing with those boards is that they're really open to community people in the sense, I mean, they're, they're really cool for, for users, not only developers. They are different form factors. They are really different from your desktops and laptops. Uh, there are endless things you can make with those, and endless applications. They run the same drivers. You have USB, Wi-Fi. Uh, you can do, uh, create lots of cool things with them, the things we're not even thinking yeah, about. And, you know, if you, if you haven't done embedded development, you just kind of are interested in, you know, the talk, 
One thing that's embedded development's changed a lot from what it was 10 years ago, when I, maybe even longer than that. When I took a job uh, doing embedded development, I had been doing just systems level uh, C programming before, and I was kind of scared getting uh, into embedded development. And then the first day at work, I went, well, this device has 256 megs of RAM and you know, basically unlimited storage, and I'm you know, just using straight up Linux code. So it, you know, there are guys that are doing some crazy stuff in assembly code and stuff like that, but there's a lot of, you know, we're running Unity on a panda board, so there's, uh, you can do anything that you're doing in your normal uh, x86 life on ARM. Plus things you can't do, like running on battery for extended amount of time. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, any other uh, questions or comments? Or? All right, well, thanks a lot for coming on this uh, Friday afternoon. Everybody's ready to go pack their bags and go home, so appreciate your time.